In today's session, we're excited to dive into the hot topic of recruiting. So investing in your bench strength, how to recruit and grow your team for rapid growth. I know that at BC Tech, we often hear from our members how competitive the talent market is in BC. So we thought we'd assemble some folks who are out there in the field uh, to gain some perspective on the topic. How are tech companies effectively recruiting talent in the current environment? Uh, what strategies are working to attract top talent? Uh, and what do you need to be thinking about when you're growing your team? I'd love to start by hearing a bit from each of you about your experience and about your current role. So maybe Alex will go in the order we started with and I'll have it, uh, have you start. Yeah, sounds great. Well, as I like really appreciate the introduction, Erica, and very excited to be here. Um, so I have six years of, of recruitment experience uh, helping companies across North America scale their revenue teams. And I have mostly focused within the B2B tech space, but I also have experience recruiting in professional services, manufacturing and consumer goods. Um, as Erica mentioned, I'm currently a talent acquisition manager at Clue. Uh, as I imagine a lot of you are on this call, we are rapidly scaling our organization. So super excited to be a part of this panel and, uh, you know, engage in this dialogue and, and hopefully learn a lot from all of you today as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Warren, maybe I'll pass it over to you next. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Erica. And thank you, Rabisi Tech, for the invitation to be part of this panel and for everyone attending. After 35 year uh, HR career working with local hyper organized hyper growth organization, and Fortune 500 companies that you mentioned, Erica, and I'll focus on giving my talent, time, and treasure back to the community, not necessary in that order. I've had the good fortune to be on the leadership team on two different companies recognized by BC Tech Companies of the Year. As you mentioned, Launchpad being the most recent. With an active retirement life, I spend one third of my time working with CEOs from diverse industries, architecting their human capital and business strategies, help them to achieve their strategic um, objectives. Today I'm here representing one of my clients, Launchpad. It's been a total joy to uh, work with uh, their leadership team. Launchpad is a people and integration services company. We're on a special advisor. So thanks again. Awesome. Yes, I can see I'm waving at the team of the Launchpad team on the call. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Sherburn, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sherb. I've been in the tech industry for over 20 years now. Um, I had the great opportunity to work for key industries in their heydays, gaming, telecom, agricultural companies, startups, SaaS, pass, everything, everything and everything I had done before once or one company before. Um, one unique thing about me is basically I have worked almost every position in the company possible from office management, QA, development, all the way up to founder, owner, and partner. Uh, and currently now, I have joined my passions with people in business. Uh, I am currently the CPO for a great company called Soul Savvy. Uh, we are a retail CPG media service company, and we are building an end-to-end -end platform for people who love sneakers, NFTs, uh, streetwear, everything else beyond that. Uh, we don't sell sneakers, though, um, and I'm really glad to be here. Talk to everyone here. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. And I have permission, I guess I could call you Sharp is what you're saying. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Everyone does. All right. Um, well, as I said at the top, we all know the talent market is super competitive. And so that that's our reality that we're living within. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you. How do you differentiate, differentiate yourselves? And maybe sure, I'll come back to you and you can maybe kick us off there. For sure. I mean, depending on the size of the company, where you are as a company right now, uh, if you're a startup, mid-sized company or big company, you will have your three factors where right? you have your compensation, right? You have your packages, right? You have your ESOP plan, maybe bonuses and everything else. Inside the company, you have your culture, you have your, maybe your CSR planning, foundations or core values, all those wonderful things. To me, those are status quo. Um, you must have those things, no matter what it is. Um, my two factors that are really important for me are the people in your company. Uh, they're your evangelists. They are the people there to, you know, promote you internally, externally. They get great referrals. And the very last part for me is being on all the perks and benefits you have in the company is the first person the candidate talks to. So it could be myself. It could be a recruiter like Alex. It could be anybody. You're no longer that old term, a gatekeeper. Uh, you're not going inside and saying, okay, great. This person is not good for a company. This person is bad for a company. You're there to actually listen to the candidate. If you have a great candidate coming in, through a job board or a reach out, in mail, whatever, how you found this person to talk to, 
you are there now to listen to them, to understand what they want, what they need, and if the company can provide that for them. It could be salary, it could be personal benefits, but really now these days, people are looking for the extra. You know, can you provide the extra? You're there to listen and then talk to them. We don't do interviews anymore, they are chats. So I think the key part for me is the first contact, the first experience of micro events and the people in your company. Got it. It's all about the person and it's all about the fit. So Alex, would you agree with that? I saw your head nodding. Yes, yes, my head gave me away. I, I wholeheartedly would agree with that. I think, um, you know, to Sherb's point, I think before you can really look at like the how and, and really getting into those candidate conversations, I do think that it's also really important to define the why and get really clear on, you know, what it is that you're actually looking for with each position, what your non-negotiables are as a company and honest about what your unique value proposition actually is. Because to Sherb's point, there are a lot of organizations out there that, you know, offer competitive benefits, just got recent rounds of fundings, offer competitive, uh, you know, vacation plans and things like that. So what is it specifically that would draw a candidate to your organization? And in, in order to actually figure that out, I feel like you need to tap into your greatest resource at your company, which is your people. Talk to them. Like, what do they like about working at your company? Uh, based on the interview process, did the role and the organization turn out to be what they were sold and told during that, that interview process? And if they were actively interviewing, which most candidates are today if they're chatting with your organization. Why did they choose you? What was the deciding factor for them? So then you can actually identify trends and solidify what that unique value prop is for your organization. So you can have those candid discussions that that Sherb was referring to. Got it. No, that's great. Everyone's interviewing, right? Assume everyone's interviewing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Default. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Over to you, Warren. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I certainly echo um, Sherb's um, comment about the candidate experience. Um, so that's certainly, you know, when he and I worked side by side at AppNovation, that was something we were trying to build as part of the, the recruitment DNA there. And also Alex commented about uh, people. So the reality is most companies are doing the same thing in a highly competitive market. There, uh, there's a very little differentiation, differentiation. I believe it starts with culture. At, App, at Launchpad, it's a fundamental belief that culture leads and starts with the founder and CEO, uh, Bruce Key, uh, like, and it permeates throughout the organization. A people-centric talent management framework starts with how the company is organized, how it recruits, how it develops its people, and how it rewards its employees. So embedded in Launchpad's DNA is a commitment for their employees. There's a saying at Launchpad is hone your craft. Secondly, it's a clearly defined strategy, which includes company values and people metrics. I believe in forging the link uh, between strategy and talent. My advisory work at Launchpad is the marriage of talent and strategy. So, uh, On the talent side, um, maybe let's flip the coin um, and talk about those key motivators. So obviously compensation plays a role. Um, so does the you know company you know, purpose, job flexibility, and, and obviously culture. So what are you seeing as the driving factors for, si for why someone would choose one company over another? Um, and maybe even what's changed in those motivators over the last 24 months? So um, Alex, I'll start with you and maybe you can give some perspective. I'm also want to recognize Clue was RTS company of the year for culture. <laughs> and so I'm guessing culture is going to play a key role in your answer. 100%. Yes, yes. Culture plays a huge, huge role for people. I mean, I think we'd all agree we spend a heck of a lot of time at work. So you want to enjoy the place that you work, enjoy the people that you work with and feel like your work is, is making an impact. I think key motivators are, of course, going to vary greatly, you know, person to person. But I think that there has been a huge shift in the past 24 months in terms terms of the priority of those motivators. I think, you know, to your point, Erica, about compensation benefits, all of that stuff, I think was very uh, high, if not top of the list for a lot of candidates pre COVID, but we've seen those kind of drop down in priority. They're still definitely important to people. Don't get me wrong, but I think things like um, ownership and autonomy over the, the role that they're going to be in over their career journey after that role, uh, really looking for strong 
strong mentorship and leadership uh, from the person that they're going to be directly working with and their ability to like impact and have uh, ha have and see that impact on the organization uh, and the role that they're actually playing in that growth as well. Excellent. I'll come back to you, Warren. Maybe what are some of the driving factors you're seeing? Yeah, the hard fact is uh, financial reward is a key motivator. You know, salary is um, unfortunately king for many, especially the never ending increasing costs in that Vancouver. Uh, for small growth companies like Launchpad, I always recommend taking the spotlight away from pay as long as it's competitive for your size and industry, kind of comparing apples and apples. You know, a, a smaller ABC company can't compare with Bell or Accenture, for example. Other key motivators for talent, in addition to wealth and rewards, uh, such as um, exciting work, a great company, a great company includes the culture, the values, great leaders. Is it well managed and career development in terms of growth, advancement, uh, company committed to individuals and lifestyle? You know, we need to kind of go beyond what I call the hygienes uh, that companies do offer. Um, at Launchpad, we developed the concept of the three C's, culture, which is strong commitment to communication and, com and commitment in general, career development, and the third C, compensation. So the past few years, I have seen a trend from job seekers looking for companies who have a strong you know, requirement uh, for a, a company that's focused on culture and a strong commitment to corporate social responsibility. The key motivators of talent should be specific for the, unique, for the company's unique brand. A good question to flush, flush out in your company or motivators is for talent is to ask yourself and your team, why does an employee care to work at your company? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Um, maybe I'll pass it over to you. And I'm curious, even in terms of like motivators and then anything that's changed in the last 24 months. Yeah, I think I echo everything that Alex and Warren said. It's very true. I think the biggest thing too, now you see candidates who are from the fangs, uh, Facebook and so on and so forth, they're looking to join smaller companies because they want impact. They they do care for salary, don't get me wrong. They care about what you have, perks and benefits and everything else. Having autonomy, like Alex said, and having impact within the organization on every level is what they want beyond their own succession planning or their own growth. They want to see the company beyond the CSR side of it. They want to see they're, you're making a change in some industry. You're doing something really cool, something unique and different. So they want to be part of that now. So you have a lot of people leaving big companies, Fortune 500 companies, 100 companies, whatever it is, they want to have impact. I think it's the biggest change right now. And they are, I think a lot of candidates now are a little bit tired of hearing about the current climate we're in right now. And they want asking companies, what are you doing? What are you doing different? And those are the things that are uh, the biggest questions that candidates have right now. Um, it is a lot different in the past two years, three years. I think can experience candidates in general have changed in their maturity also. Uh, they're looking for different things. They're, they're more experienced now. They're not just looking for a job. Uh, and that's the biggest thing right now. I think that's the biggest change. Got it. Got it. Um, go ahead, Warren. Oh, okay. I just want to kind of add, you know, beyond the key motivators, there are perks. And I suggest kind of categorizing into three buckets. What I call the first bucket, essentials like informal, you know, dress code, flexible hours, computer provided. And a second bucket would be value add and differentiation, which uh, Sherp mentioned, the differentiator, you know, such as, you know, health coverage. And health coverage could take different flavors now. Uh, vacation above the minimum legal. And lastly, the third bucket, nice to have, such as wellness program, a bicycle program. Yeah. <laughs> <That's a joke. laughs> yeah. But the biggest thing too, uh, I think another comment here is that we are in a work from one culture now that has shifted a lot. And a lot of candidates are asking, okay, great. Can I work in different regions? Can I work um, Canadian? I want to work in uh, us now because my family's there. Um, the work from home policies. And I think the biggest thing now is with a lot of family friendly policies, really key too. So you see that huge change um, with that change though, gives more opportunity for employers. Uh, can you hire around the world? Work from home does work across the board. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. Candidates are looking for those answers, right? So, absolutely, Alex. And I saw you nodding again there, and I'm, just, I'm sure you're seeing um, similar patterns in, in the change as well um, in terms of your recruiting for Clue. Absolutely, yeah. I think like I mean, I would I would echo everything that you know Sherman Warren has said. I think that things have shifted a lot, like over the past two years, but um, really being 
uh, flexible, open and honest about what is realistic for your business and being able to have those candid conversations with candidates is going to be the most important thing at the end of the day. Awesome. Um, no, no, we've got a range of attendees joining us today um, and, and quite a few that are startups that I saw on the list. Um, I'd like to hear maybe from you guys about your experience when you're in the midst of scaling, um, when you're hiring, doing a lot of hiring at the same time and how you tackle those really tremendous moments of growth. Um, were there kind of key roles that you needed to fill to help your company grow and scale and, and how did you kind of adapt to, to that massive growth? So maybe Warren, I think you've got um, a wealth of experience across your career. Maybe I can turn to you on this first. Yeah, no, thanks, Erica. Well, I have the benefit of time, not necessarily personal talent, but certainly at eBay, as an example, we scale rapidly over a thousand employees in less than two years. You know, it was by hiring, you know, and then focus in hiring classes. We were kind of hired in batches. And we did the hiring in batches. We did the orientation on batches. We did the training in, in batches. So what I call classes at um, Elastic Path. We also had to scale up extremely quickly. Uh, was a surprise to our leadership team that we would win the contract for the 2010 Winter Olympics um, 12 years ago in terms of uh, operating the Olympics online store. So in that case, we took approach also by hiring classes. And another example would be in night back, way back in 1986, we Vancouver hosted the World Exposition. So we had to hire 10,000 employees in half a year to staff the World Exposition. And that was really creating SWAT teams, creating you know, uh, teams that were focused in different stages of the recruitment process. So some of the recruitment ideas that I've used over my career, um, billboards, um, that was really big during the tech.com um, uh, and you know, really you know, and soft, it was, uh, having it in uh, QR codes. We were early adopters of that. Hiring fears in offices and hotels, in the Commodore ballroom, you know, company lease cars for employees with the highest number of employee referrals. And with a caveat that that, that lease car would actually have the company brand on it. You, you know, you can't drive a, a Miata or a Mazda. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll actually have some sort of opportunity to show the company brand. And job ads in magazines and journals that talent, uh, that the talent you're seeking would read. And referral prizes that are really customized and personalized to <laughs> Uh, other uh, things that we've tried and implemented, uh, hiring people to pass out leaflets on sidewalks, really kind of engaging the community. Uh, for example, in the 2010 Olympics, that was an uh, ideal opportunity because there was an excitement in the city. Uh, train staff to use LinkedIn to help with recruitment to promote company brand. Nowadays, most people do use LinkedIn, uh, but back then when LinkedIn was start starting out and was a new uh, tool, we, uh, we had that as part of the training of the staff. You know, using all sorts of guerrilla tactics, anything to get some message out about job openings, establish war rooms, set up recruitment swap teams. And, then, and it's super important to really partner with your departments for recruitment activities, engage and energize technical staff to be part of the overall hiring process. If you have 200 employees, I always say that you actually have 200 recruiters. Okay. Everyone in the company is a recruitment ambassador. So work closely and often with marketing team, to create your EVP brand and recruit message. I always keep recruiting in terms of as um, a 24 by seven activity, a candidate you may be speaking now, may not be interested now, but you certainly want to create that positive experience because well, we always hear the story that they had a, a disagreement with their managers blank. Right? And say, I need to call someone. Hopefully it's your company and call you first. Always be hunting, uh, just like in the sales, a ABC, always be closing for talent to consistently provide the best candidate experience. All right, I think people, I hope people are taking notes there. That was a good, <laughs> that was wonderful, Warren, thank you. Um, I, let's, keep, let's keep these ideas coming. Sure, but I'd love to hear from you. The question going back was, um, you know, how do you tackle tremendous moments of growth? And if you wanna give us some of your top tips, um, much appreciated, I'm sure, for the audience gathered today. Um, and depending on the stage of the company here, where you guys are right now, if you're in a startup, you know, first seed money really depends on what you try and do. Um, you may not have all the capital to hire the top end guys right now, but the first, very first part is basically hire people around you who are 
I call them specialized journalists who can actually help you do different parts of the business, can help you grow business and everything else. Change and growth uh, never stops. I mean, from 10 people to 50 people to 100 people, everything does change. Like Warren said, all the fundamentals are really, really key. You can do different guerrilla marketing and hiring, candidate hiring. But I think the key thing is when you do have a startup, though, you must have the upside down tri triangle. You must have your top end guys or girls who can actually drive your company forward to make revenue. Uh, it could be staff logging, it could be creating a product, it could be marketing influencers, whatever it is. Those first, I would say, first 50, 30, 50 people, they are key. They are key to actually making something happen in the company. The culture part of it, um, the evangelist part of it. So for me, how you tackle these, this growth is basically get ready for it. Um, honestly, it's, it's, it's always there. Um, get ready for the problems. It will never be golden and rosy all the time. Every day is a change. Every day there's a problem. More people, more problems, more money, more problems. Um, but it's a good thing. Um, as long as you get people who are adaptable in your industry, in your company, you can succeed. Um, every problem you have means you learn something and you're growing something. So mistakes are going to happen. Um, so the biggest thing for me is that Find the key individuals who can support your company as you grow. Um, and you will make mistakes in hiring. That's okay. Um, but make those actions, when I say those actions, voluntary, involuntary releases, get ready for those. Be decisive. Have those choices ready. And get ready for plan B and C and D. Um, have those cards in your back pocket. Uh, that's growth. That's growth in any company from a Fortune 500 company to a 10 people company right now. So um, get ready for change. That's the biggest thing. Awesome. All right. Those are great words. Get ready for change. Have all the plan A, B, C, and, and through the alphabet ready to go. Um, Alex, how, what, how do you weigh in on that? And what are your plan A, B, C, D, E? Yeah, I mean, I, I would totally agree with that. I think you need to be prepared for change and also be prepared that what got you here won't get you there. Like at different stages of growth, your company needs to have different strategies to be able to get people in the door. And I love what Warren said about, you know, if you have 200 people on your team, you have 200 recruiters. Recruiting is absolutely a team sport. And I think it's really important to ensure that um, you are enabling teams and uh, incentives incentivizing teams in some instances to ensure that you are, uh, I guess, elevating them to bring great people uh, into, into the organization. I would uh, definitely say that like key hires are going to look different at different stages, but I think that as you are going through rapid stages of scaling, it's also important to ensure that you not only have the right people to get them in the door initially, like bringing in great, uh, you know, talent acquisition people, for instance, to be able to uh, entice people to come in the door, but also having great people on the other side. Once they're in the door, how are you actually enabling and setting them up for success once they're on the team because uh, that will not only help you uh, get them in the door but also to keep them long term absolutely i might come back on oh sorry go ahead warren sorry okay i i, I just um i was remiss not answering part of your question the key roles that help your company grow and scale and um that was um i would agree with sure's point because it really depends on your business also depends on what stage your business in terms of affordability, your budget. Having an accurate company hiring forecast that's aligned to company revenue is important. Determine the number of type and types of roles to help your company grow and scale. Uh, use an appropriate like recruiter to number of recs uh, ratio is also helpful. But I also want to kind of close this on this question and my response to the question is pump for town at all levels. Tap diverse pools. I know your, one of your last questions about diversity. Uh, reach out to passive candidates. Always continue to reach out to the passive ones. And if the, if the candidate doesn't seem like the right fit now, it could be very much a fit in the future. Okay. The possibilities are infinite. That's great. And I think all of you touched on kind of um, everyone being an ambassador, um, creating internal evangelists. Do you mind if I come back to you just quickly to, to ask you how? How do you do that in, in within your organizations? How do you create those internal ambassadors um, more at a tactical level? So maybe, Sherb, do you mind if I come to you on that quickly? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it really depends on the culture you have in your company, right? So it could be that you have a referral program to that's inside your company. You, I wouldn't say mandate, but you ask them to, you know, in LinkedIn post certain uh, job openings and everything else. Using social media and everything else, um, the biggest thing is 
they need to want to do it. Uh, you can't force it on anybody. They want to be those evangelists for you. Um, and, you know, those are the biggest things. They want to need to do it. And the last part is that is basically kind of give them a helping hand, say maybe, hey, hiring manager, can you post this on your LinkedIn and so on and so forth. So they are your evangelists. So they need to want to do it. And you kind of give them a little bit of a helping hand, say, maybe post this up for me or talk about this or put it on social media. Um, those are the factors I think can really help out for evangelists. Excellent. Alex, and, and is that how you approach it with, in terms of a team sport as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a team sport, but I also think it's, you know, how you show up for your employees every day is going to make them great ambassadors, right? If you are valuing your employees, if you're treating them well, if you're empowering them and, um, you know, giving them the opportunities uh, to have that ownership and that impact on the business. I think it's not only going to be in how they post on LinkedIn or Glassdoor that's going to make an impact. It's how they talk about their jobs and how they talk about the company that they work with, with the people that are the most important in their life, their friends, their family, and word of mouth has a really big impact, I think, on just employer branding as a whole as well. Excellent. And I actually had a follow-up question, Warren, um, about the average number or the you mentioned the number of active requisitions each recruiter should have the the right ratio um so do you have any comment on that in terms of like what the the right number is or the average number is that you'd recommend i just had a, a message directly to me from one of our attendees yeah as i mentioned it really depends on an industry and type of business like for example if you're recruiting um, people in manufacturing you know those are you know those are important roles but the roles don't vary very much so a recruiter could, in fact, have a, a rec of the same type of positions and could probably handle a higher number as opposed to recruiters that's recruiting from marketing to finance for tech. So their ability to actually be successful to recruit the number of open recs would probably be likely smaller. But generally speaking, again, it depends on your, on your business. Um, the critical mass that I experienced working recruiters that they could handle, and, and this depends on where the recruiting is at. You could have a number of positions that are brand new that are in the rec stage or posting stage, and you have ones on, on, the, on the offer stage. But you know, one to uh, 12 to 15 is maybe a, a common ratio. Uh, but I do, hopefully that answers the question, but I do want to uh, respond to your last question prior to this. Uh, it's about the promoters. So this, these uh, ambassadors for your company, they're really your promoters and how you engage your internal promoters is through transparent, open, and continuous communication. So they could see and connect the dots within your organization. And um, it's, it's, it's a really, it's what I call free fuel because sharing that information doesn't cost the, the company any money, but at least they see that they're connected and they now know how to better represent your brand or your company. And a key measurement for promoters is the uh, ENPS, the Employee Net Promoter Score. You know, how likely am I going to, you know, uh, recommend uh, my friend to my company? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe I'll shift to to our next um, topic, which is around diversity. And I know it's come up a couple of times um, earlier, but with a with a lens on diversity, how are each of you approaching um, or reflecting DEI practices within your organization um and maybe i'll start with you sharp to comment on that yeah so again i always say it depends on where your maturity of your company is if you're a young startup you may not have this lens totally uh because of the current state of your company but when you have and you have the time uh which is really important you have programs in your own company it could be a dna committee that actually looks into this or at the same time i want to say this may be a wrong thing to say, but what I believe is basically you hire best talent, no matter what it is. Um, and main thing for me is basically when you try to reach out different communities is how you job post, your job post is general itself. Uh, how, what your language you put in there, are you actually having these programs internally for your company to actually reach these communities? In the end, I never like to say that within the current climate you are right now, are you checking a box off? I don't believe in this call a diversity hire. Um, uh, I really hate that term. Um, you hire the best talent, but at the same time, be inclusive. Are you reaching those communities? Do you have practices in your, in your company to actually impact those communities? Are you doing something about it? Um, and honestly, in the end, looking internally for your own organization, looking at your leadership and your company itself, are you a diverse company in general? Um, are you doing that in general right now? Are you trying to actually 
do a quota? Are you doing it because you need to do it? Um, if you're doing that, I would say, please stop. Um, it's really about what your own personal message for your company is and what you stand for. And that's how it really works in recruitment. It goes across the board. It's a message for the company across the board. So I'm hoping no one does that. Um, maybe a hard stance for me, but it wouldn't be a diverse recruitment. It's more basically putting a lens across the board and recruiting in every area possible. Absolutely. Alex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would uh, I would very much agree with that. I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's it's important to understand and kind of get a bit of a, a state of the union in terms of like, where are you at? Um, uh, like an, in terms of your your size and, and growth stage of the organization, but also um, do you already have like an inclusive environment at your work? I think you need to, um, it, it's very important from a recruitment standpoint, but I also think that it's very important to create uh, like an open feedback loop with the people who already work in your organization to understand where there are maybe opportunities for you to improve. Um, and from there, how that actually shows up, you know, similar to what Sherp said is, you know, in your job postings, is the language that you're using inclusive? Can you put your, your job postings through a gender decoder, for example, to understand, are you um, unknowingly like using language that uh, is exclusive in, in, its, uh, in its form? I also think, um, it's, I mean, I feel like we've, we've had this theme of it being a team sport come up time and time again, but I think it's not only, uh, you know, the responsibility of the people function of the business or the recruiters of the business to really lead the way on DE and I, it needs to be a priority across all functions of the business. And, um, I would encourage you to, again, leverage the people that you have internally, because odds are there's going to be people within your business who care a lot and are very passionate about DE and I, and who may have some great ideas and, uh, out of the box ideas about how that could actually show up in recruitment efforts um, and like inside of your organization day to day as well. All right, Warren, I'll come to you next. Yeah, to echo Hashur's point, um, uh, the, uh, D and I should not be a, a hiring uh, quota or a hiring target. You want to ultimately hire the best candidate. Uh, but, but when this whole focus around diversity uh, hires started, um, uh, it was made, I guess, worse in, in a way in that the federal government or the government of Canada require you to actually have targets to in order to provide them services and products. So I'm unhappy that we moved away from that. But that said, de and practices must be reflected in all areas of your business, not only for recruitment. Um, so that's different than actually hiring targets. You, know, you want to hire the best quality candidates, but you need to have the DEI practices. It starts with outreach to high school students and in introducing them to the world work, and particularly high school, school, high school girls about the tech field as a career option or fields that are not traditionally you know, open uh, or, uh, or females would consider. Reach out to access disability organization such as Job West or Disability Alliance of BC or UBC Center for Accessibility to speak to their clients and their members, forge strong relationships with uh, diverse range of students who are early in science, tech, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM programs, speak and recruit at uh, multicultural, multilingual, and intercultural uh, organizations such as Success or Mosaic to reach out to new professionals who have newly arrived in Canada you know, those kind of untapped uh, talent. Hold open houses, career fairs, office tours to those groups of undertapped talent. Encourage your business leaders to volunteer and or sit on, uh, you know, diverse uh, nonprofit boards, such as the Lorry Institution, a national organization, you know, focused on d &I, which started actually in Vancouver 31 years ago, which I had the honor to actually be on their board and be a board secretary for, for a number of years. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, I do want to just quickly remind our audience that um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat. Um, I do see see one there that maybe I'll go to next. Um, and I just want to make one quick uh, comment before I move there, which is just on um, encouraging um, young women and young young people to, to consider jobs in tech. And BC Tech hosts an education session for teachers. Uh, for K-12 teachers. We have one next Friday on the Pro-D Day. And it's always fascinating to talk to teachers about jobs in tech and arm them with information that they could share in the classrooms. Because really, 
for some of them, for some teachers, they don't have the, the tools or the understanding um, to really share those opportunities. And so by connecting with each of those teachers, we know that we're also connecting with a classroom of students and hopefully having an influence. So um, a lot of, it's a really great program. Um, so the question I'm seeing in the chat um, is uh, from Julia. And she asks, has the great resignation been a challenge or an opportunity? Um, so curious to get your thoughts there. Maybe I'll come to you first, Alex. Opportunity. I think it is a huge <laughs> opportunity. Um, I, as you know, I think we talked about a little bit earlier in the session, um, candidate priorities and motivators have kind of shifted, but I think that, um, in this big resignation or this big shuffle, candidates are a lot more clear on what it is that they're actually looking for. And so I think it's an opportunity to not only, you know, get great talent, but I also think that it's a good opportunity to hopefully like keep them longer term as well than we've probably seen uh, over the past couple of years with, with uh, much shorter tenures, specifically within the tech scene. Maybe Sharp, do you wanna take that up next? Uh I agree with Alex too. It is a positive thing for all of us here too, but at the same time as negative also. The reason why I say it, I agree that Alex is a positive thing for us, but at the same time as negative because people are saying to themselves, I'm actually tired of tech. I actually don't want to be in tech anymore. I actually don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to be in this environment. They want to do something completely different. Um, and we lose great talent too, because they don't want to work in tech anymore. They maybe want to do something completely opposite. So we do lose some great talent because even me reaching out to people I used to know, I was like, no, I'm not in tech anymore. I just don't want to do, I'm burnt out. Um, so it's a positive and negative in different rights, uh, but it is true what Alex said right now. There's a lot of people looking for great companies to join. They know what they want right now. So the positive side is, is outweighing the negative side. Uh, don't get me wrong, but it's a good opportunity for us. Awesome. Warren, would you agree? Yeah. Positive more than negative? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I certainly agree that's more of an opportunity, but there is a, a challenge to kind of think out of the box. Uh, but any challenge, there's always creates an opportunity. Um, so I think um, I think the great resignation was also created by more kind of the macro um, uh, political geo situation as well. Uh, people kind of reflecting on their lives and the importance, and then you know, making those shifts. But I think this is an opportunity for us to, like every time in business history, there's an opportunity to respond and you know like the dot-com boom or the or the, co or the global pandemic so I, I think it's more of an opportunity and, and it's great to see some of the new best practices are, are being developed by you know different organizations uh, uh, here locally and globally mm -hmm. that's excellent um and and certainly if if priorities are shifting if you're uh, having a chat, not an interview, and you're listening um, when you're in that initial recruitment phase, um, that can help help to find the right match and the right fit a lot a lot better. So that's that's excellent. We had um, another question here in the chat. Um, we've got from Daniela. She said, "Thanks so much for the opportunity to participate in this great event. At the beginning, you mentioned the importance of listening to employees." Um, what are the strategies and tools you recommend? So maybe you guys can dip, kind of dip into your toolkits um, and share. Um, so important, the importance of listening to employees. So what are strategies and toolkits that you recommend? Maybe Cheryl sure will come to you first. Yeah, sure. Uh, anonymous surveys are really key for my company. Uh, reaching those, making sure that's truly anonymous too. Um, making sure they can actually speak freely. Town halls, uh, using internal communication tools. And sometimes just calling people out to a certain level, um, having leadership within different departments, kind of be the voice for that department also. Um, those are the ways that we do it here. And the last thing is really, if you have a chance as leaders or even as a recruiter, it doesn't matter who you are, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them. 15 minutes, check in with them, see how they're doing. It could be a personal level. Uh, it could be a non-personal level. It could be a work level. Uh, just hearing from them, see what's going on in their lives. If you're not connected with your people, understanding what they're going through and what's happening, uh, you don't know what's going on with them. So um, just reaching out is the easiest way of doing it. If you're people leader or leaders in general, just do the first five minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. Um, those are really key uh, to understanding what's going on as a whole for your organization. Awesome. Warren, what are your thoughts? Um, communicating employees is super important. And um, the I think there needs to be a mentality in terms of involving your employees and appreciate them. 
you know, I always say that, you know, how we appreciate an employee or employees as opposed to recognize. Recognize is about giving a gift card or a trophy, but appreciating comes from the heart, comes from the soul. So employees do notice that. Um, a Sherp's point on one-on-ones, I'm a huge advocate of what I call care meetings. Uh, um, care is kind of play on word in terms of caring for an employee, and it stands for communicate, acknowledge, respond, and engage. So it's about caring and that for an employee. You know, there's a different types of tools, collaboration tools, different ways you could bond with employees. Uh, but also when I say involve, you know, encourage people to be involved in uh, projects, uh, internal projects, uh, and involve them cross-functionally because that gets uh, communication and engagement at a much higher level. Uh, introduce or use post surveys and upward feedback. Upward feedback is an opportunity to be more connected and provide feedback to your direct manager and so they can grow and develop. Because often when individuals reach to a management level, the, the kind of feedback you know, that they get from their performance diminishes. You know, use an internet, use collaboration tools like Slack, employee social networks, particularly now with uh, businesses like Launchpad, it's a very, you know, uh, geographically dispersed organization, you know, video chats, um, et cetera. So using those type of tools are some of the ideas. But I really believe in the uh, being social beings, we need to communicate and engage and, and appreciate them. Awesome. Alex, what are your thoughts, especially, um, I guess a kind of a subtext to that is <clears throat> engaging with employees, especially now when we're fully virtual or most teams are fully yeah. virtual. Um, and so those strategies might have changed um, in the last couple of years, but do you have any uh, tools in your toolkit that you'd share? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it also like comes back to like culture as a whole. Like I think if you can create and facilitate a, a very like open and transparent culture, a culture of radical candor where people are comfortable and encouraged to give all types of feedback, positive and especially constructive at all levels of the organization, that's going to be in very important from the get-go but i also think that naturally not all people even if you have that culture not everyone is going to feel comfortable giving the ceo or you know a vp level person within the organization that feedback and so to sherb's earlier point about uh getting anonymous surveys for example or utilizing like an employee engagement platform um to really understand and pull and collect that data um on a quarterly or or biannual basis i think is important for you to be able to to understand um, where your business is at and if there's any concerning trends that you can then proactively work with the deal, uh, the leader to deal with. Awesome. And Alex, a shout out from Adrian in the, in the chat to you for, <laughs> awesome. um, uh, so another question here. So, um, it's clear that obviously things have changed in the last two years with people working from home. Um, and having their work-life balance quite disrupted, burnout is becoming a bigger concern and reality in the workforce. So how do you think this can be remedied, not just temporarily, but in the long run, um, with especially companies in the perm potential permanent work from home model? Um, so Sheriff, what are your thoughts on that? The, the thought of burnout um, even, and the work from home model? Uh, going back to the previous comment too, leaders and managers need to understand their staff and their people. So beyond anything else, if you don't know what's going on in your own departments and your team, especially the people, you don't see the burnout. So that's the key part there. You need to communicate with your team, understand where they are and where their headspace is at. And you should know if your team's working 16, 18 hour days or even longer, uh, week on week on end. Um, but beyond that, uh, for the company part of it too, it's that forget the you know, person benefits where you get wellness allowance and you get you know, nice gifts and everything else. I believe in vacations. I believe in, I wouldn't call it forced vacations, but I believe in people taking their time to taking a break, turning off the computer and moving forward and doing their own personal life. Right now, myself, I'm sitting in my office right now, but my I'm in my house. Uh, you need to step away. You need to reconnect with your family. So I wouldn't call a forced time off. It's more basically recognizing people need time off and actually telling people to take vacations. It's okay. Take a wellness, wellness, wellness day if you'd like to. Um, but at the same time, I think people are also missing the connection, the human connection that we talked about here. So, you know, plan office trips, uh, plan team to go to the office so you reconnect, get the energy back. Uh, at the same time, it could be what we do at Soul Savvy here is every year we bring the whole company to one location. 
Uh, and this is a fun time for people to get to know each other, relax. And this is literally turning your computer off, don't do any work, and actually get to know each other. So having the human factor and human connection is really key for us too. Um, but then I think it's knowing your people uh, and knowing where they're ready to burn out and giving those days and lose or vacation or saying, you know, take a break. I'll take it over for you. I think as leaders, we need to take the opportunity to say, let me take the responsibility on for you, or I can push it for later. Uh, and having those decisions made for that staff or that employee. That's awesome. Alex, what are your thoughts on the work from home model that we touched on that in the previous question a little bit, but maybe you can comment. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of pros, but it can be a double-edged sword to, you know, this individual's question, like burnout and the lack of boundaries and blurred lines that come with working from home. Um, it, it's a hard, it's a really hard challenge. And I think a challenge that we're all facing, every company is, is facing right now. But I think it is really important that like leadership model, um, those boundaries, um, not sending, you know, Slack messages or emails to people at, uh, you know, 1130 PM in the evening, there's tools like boomerang, for example, with Gmail, where you can, you, if you work best at night, that's awesome for you. Um, but you know, you can load those messages to come out at a later time. Or if you are someone who works really well at night and you are going to be sending those messages at that time, um, letting your team know, Hey, I typically do my best work or I'm catching up on emails at this period of time. Do not respond to this, like make sure that the boundaries are clear and that people feel um, able and encouraged to kind of take that time off um, and have that life, celebrate those wins that are happening outside of the work so that the entire company can see and celebrate those alongside individuals as well. That's great. Thanks, Alex. Warren, I'll come to you for your comments. Yeah, I, I certainly agree in terms of uh, Sherb and Alex's um, comment about uh, boundaries. But you don't really know, I guess, the boundaries unless you're actually uh, continuously con con communicating, connecting with your teams. And that's certainly super important with more employees working remotely. They're not only rem working remotely in their local time zones, but in different time zones. Um, and the importance of those care meetings and continuous connection and communication, kind of the big two C's. Uh, but also creating a culture uh, where there's a trust and um, team members can feel comfortable um, expressing their boundaries, you know, expressing that you know, they're feeling a little burnt out, they're feeling a bit, you know, uh, they need to take some time out. Um, you know, employees, you don't want to have them get into kind of a negative spiral where they're not actually opening up. So it is important, you know, the number one job, you know, I, I think managers or people, particularly people managers, it's really around you know, the, the people. That's how you kind of engage and, you know, if everyone together is kind of rolling in the same same direction. So at Launchpad, you know, there are a number of different mechanisms uh, to do that. And we ensure that we're, they're actually built into the calendars where they're you know, all hands meeting, one-on-ones, uh, uh, Friday social hours. Can I, can I also add to if, if there are startups here who are a 10 people company or 20 people company, the reality of the fact is when you have a startup, I've been through three right now, um, successful startups, you work 18, 20 hour days. It's, it's part of the startup life. Uh, expect that. Do not expect your employees to do the same thing you do though. Um, if you're owner, a partner or whatever senior level you are, you may be doing those hours. That's what you're signing up for. So that's the reality of it all. But at the same time, you're hoping that you have employees who are willing to sleep under the desk with you. Um, and those are ones that drive your company, right? So um, those are the facts. That's what really does happen though. And as you grow and mature, those things do change. Uh, get ready for the change, they will change. I think all of us here have done it once in our life uh, that we slept under the desk one day or, or weeks on end uh, to get something out. Um, but those are the facts in the beginning, but later on it does change. With everything we said here, communication, one-on-ones, town halls, uh, really understanding employees, uh, having the culture in place, it does change. So, um, but the biggest thing is startups. It does happen though. It's, it's part of that sort of life. Um, 
and I know we only have a little bit of time left, but there was one more question in the chat um, around remote working equity since COVID has started and the workforce shifting to remote work. So the example here is, um, you know, a team event for employees at the office and some are only able to participate remote, participate remotely. So is this something you guys are, are facing and how are you tackling it in your organizations? Um, Alex, maybe I'll come to you. Is, is that something you guys are navigating right now? Uh, a little bit. Bit. I think we haven't quite fully gotten to this stage, just obviously with Omicron, you know, resurging, I think we've all kind of gone back to a remote first type of environment. But I will say like our viewpoint on uh, hybrid meetings where, you know, you may have people that are in an office and people that are working from home is everybody has a tile, regardless of if you are sitting in a meeting room, five of you and you have three of you remote, you all have a tile on the screen. So trying to kind of keep that consistency there, regardless of whether or not not you are physically in the same room, I think has been something that has worked really well for our business. And we do have team members spread out all across Canada and other countries as well. And so that's, that's been something that has really worked well for us. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in our company right now, like I said before, we, we, we fly everyone down twice a year to one location, no matter what it is. And we have done it in August in COVID time, heavy time it was scary, but we did it in Arizona of all places. Uh, we're doing one right now in April for Vancouver. We have global employees. Um, but the big thing here is that my previous companies, it doesn't matter where you are, we'll try to fly you down to the location if we can, or we'll fly you down to the closest location so you can actually team up with that, say Toronto. Uh, somebody in, I don't know, say, say fly down to Toronto to New York or someplace close to the East Coast to fly together and they get together and have a Christmas party or event and everything else. So like Alex said, it's a fact of life right now. We try our best uh, to get everybody included in what we try to do. But at the same time, like Christmas time, we didn't have a Christmas party. We couldn't have it. Uh, what do you do? So can we give a gift card for the whole family to have a Christmas dinner for themselves or a significant other or whatever it is? We try to keep it included in the spirit of the event as much as possible in every way possible. So um, I think people are appreciative of the swag and gift baskets and everything else, but they want to participate. How can we make them participate in that event or that talk or that meeting, whatever it is? Uh, so just think of everything outside the box. Anything you can do, try to do it. Um, I always say during COVID, just throw everything at it. Just throw anything you have. What do you think? Try to see what sticks. Uh, it's the best way uh, because... Some people may be receptive, some may not, just keep trying because you want to be included across the board. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Warren, thoughts? Yeah, I think both um, Sherb and Alex, have, um, I think what I'm hearing is also, you know, something I learned early in my HR career is being fair, equitable, and consistent. Um, so, you know, despite what external factors throw at our jobs as um, uh, recruiters, HR professionals, you know, that's kind of a model I kind of lived through with my 35 year career. So that said, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard, uh, you know, people have different levels of comfort. They want to travel or go in the office, et cetera. Um, certainly sending uh, gifts, that's more consistent, you know, but not only sending it to them, but also appreciating their family, their spouse, their partner, because they're living through what you're living through uh, at work and the pressures and demands. And uh, certainly uh, Sherb and I, uh, maybe uh, me, me a bit more, have a lot of battle scars with, uh, with startups. Uh, that's a, a very true statement and, and giving people choices uh, and, and outlets to um, relieve some of that pressure. Um, at Launchpad, you know, some of the, some of the team have been traveling. Launchpad has a, a large um, and growing PS team in South America. So some of those countries are uh, relaxing uh, their uh, restrictions. Uh, so when they are traveling, they're actually meeting with the staff, like each city have their staff that either informally are meeting based on individuals comfort level but if we have representatives from launchpad visiting other countries it's, it's it's pretty well imperative that if they feel comfortable that they're they're taking the team out they're meeting and making those connections that i mentioned uh several times during this panel connections and communications and commitment <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.